This case is so crazy, it's almost unbelievable. I have brought you over 130 cases on this channel so far, so I am kind of hard to shock. But this one shocked me. You have been warned. Viewer discretion is advised for this educational documentary. Thank you so much to all of my patrons. If your name is on screen right now, then you're a legend. Our love and respect goes out to all those affected by this dark case. Peter Bryan was born in London in 1969 to two immigrant parents from Barbados. They moved over to England in the 1950s. They were simply looking for a better life for their children. Peter was the youngest of seven siblings. Their parents worked every single day of the week. That meant that Peter and his other siblings were tended to by minders. Peter's mother was especially absent. She spent large stretches of his childhood in Barbados with her older children who had not crossed over during the move. Because he didn't get the direct attention and care that he required, Peter grew up living largely unchecked. At Shaftesbury Junior School in Forest Gate, he developed an appetite for bullying boys who were physically smaller than him. He would take their lunch money, call them names and generally demean them. There's a record of him making children his age tie his shoelaces. Peter struck wherever he saw weakness, and this was only exacerbated when he became a teenager. He joined a street gang at a young age and started smoking illicit substances at age 12. Experts think that the early substance use severely hampered his mental development. This could have been a contributing factor to his later psychosis. There's also a record of mental illness in the family, so there could be a genetic component to it as well. Peter's attitude grew worse when he entered Trinity Secondary School in Canning Town. Teachers reported that he seemed to get a sadistic kick out of dominating people and crushing their spirits. He also robbed people, touched girls inappropriately, heckled people and even slapped a female teacher. Peter only got a suspension for that transgression. He managed to remain in high school until he was 15 years old and that was when he dropped out, something that wasn't unusual at the time. It was a combination of being dyslexic and requiring a tutor to learn, a general disdain for the school and its people, and his desire to live by his own rules. From this point, things would take a radical and tragic turn for Peter, as well as those unfortunate enough to catch his eye. In 1987, at 18 years old, Peter Bryan had his first run-in with the police. He lived at the Flying Angel Custom House in East London, and he worked at a clothes stall on a market. The police received a call when he attempted to throw another resident off of the sixth floor window. According to the victim, the attack was entirely unprovoked. This hinted that Brian was perhaps suffering from some type of psychotic episode. His actions weren't based in our reality. Ultimately, the police took no action against Brian, and perhaps if they had, they would have stopped what came next. Although you've probably never heard of this man before, Peter Bryan goes on to become one of the most terrifying criminals of the 21st century. But for his monstrous pedigree, he grew up in a fairly ordinary place. East London in the 1970s and 80s was wildly different from what it is today. But the highlights of the city have remained the same throughout the generations. It is the capital and largest city of England and the United Kingdom. It houses a diverse population of 8 million people. At its centre is the Houses of Parliament, Big Ben and Westminster Abbey. Nisha Sheth was a 20-year-old college student. They were the oldest child of the Sheth family. She had a 12-year-old smart-mouthed brother and worked for her parents to support herself while she attended university. 
The Sheths were an affluent Indian family. They owned multiple fashionable Kings Road boutiques scattered throughout London. After a brief stint at the clothes store and then teaching cooking classes in a soup shelter, Brian landed one of the best jobs of his adult life. He worked as a shop assistant to Nisha. Nisha always found Brian more than a little bit strange and frankly intimidating at times. He was a large, heavy set man and he made a habit of invading her space. He would touch her inappropriately and then go on long protracted speeches. He would mutter about things that nobody else understood. The first few months of working with Peter were decent enough, but over time his personal hygiene, personality and mind seemed to deteriorate. He would change his appearance and hairstyles frequently, fully bearded on one day, clean shaven the next. It was also an open secret that Brian was a local delinquent. He bragged about how he had mugged girls like Nisha, how he had extorted people and how he had sold illicit substances. Brian did whatever he could to supplement his income from the shops, income which he often blew through by buying illicit substances. Nisha was not the only person who saw the sort of danger Peter presented. Her mother saw it too. Mrs. Sheth noticed Peter was erratic and at some point started walking around with a claw hammer which she'd stolen from their tool shed. On one occasion he even told her that he wanted to kill somebody, but given his eccentricities she didn't know what to believe. Towards the end of his stay with the Sheths, he even struck her on the shin with his belt. When Mrs. Sheth reported Peter's behaviour to her husband, he simply did not believe her. Peter treated him with respect and fairly whenever he saw him, and this meant that he grew to like him. Although he often disappeared from work for days to weeks at a time, Mr. Sheth was still willing to give him another chance. That choice would soon come to cost him everything. Brian's infatuation with Nisha Sheth was no mystery. He'd made his intentions obvious, and on one occasion he brought Nisha a nail box with flowers inside. When Nisha's brother noticed the sticker on the side and asked him where he'd stolen them from, Peter swallowed the sticker to hide the evidence and laughed off the entire interaction. Shortly after this, Nisha reported Brian for stealing clothes from their shop. She'd caught him in the act one day and told her father about it immediately. Pizza felt betrayed and showed up at the store one week later. It was now March the 18th, 1993. He had a claw hammer in his hand. He went after Nisha's 12-year-old brother, knocking him to the side. He then assaulted Nisha, who was on the phone at the time. The police report said that he hit her so hard that the white of her brain was visible. Nisha's brother watched it all happen. Brian then fled the scene of the crime when he realised what he'd done. A random bystander noticed something was wrong and chased after him. Brian managed to lose them before climbing onto the roof of a building. He was high on illicit substances and trying to throw himself off. Fortunately, or perhaps unfortunately, his survival instinct kicked in. He grabbed hold of one of the ledges of the building as he climbed down. Eventually though, his grip failed him. He then plummeted several floors, shattering both of his ankles. Brian claimed diminished responsibility. He was sentenced to Rampton Secure Hospital indefinitely after he admitted to the murder of Nisha. This was much to the protest of the Sheth family. They wanted a stricter sentence for Brian, but psychologists determined that he was mentally ill. He said he was convinced that Nisha was teasing him, and she had demanded that he kill her. In 1994, Brian was sent to Rampton Secure Hospital. There, he did make considerable progress according to the nursing staff, but he did still have occasional hiccups. There, he was diagnosed with schizophrenia. He was reported to have been initially violent, but he then settled down into the institute. Every once in a while, though, his mental health deteriorated, and Brian was caught doing alarming things. 
Whilst inside, he claimed to have gotten a kick from Nisha's death, and it seemed that he misremembered the event. He also threatened nurses with violence when he didn't get his way on several occasions. Eventually though, Brian managed to get a handle on his outbursts. In time, he masked his psychopathic tendencies so well that his doctors were convinced he was better. In 2001, just over seven years after the death of Nisha, Brian was transferred to the care of a social worker and psychiatrist. Both of these people unfortunately had very little experience with killers like Brian. He was moved to Riverside Hostel in London. This is a minimum security men's facility in North East London. There, Brian was free to come and go as he pleased, and he did behave himself for the most part, but he was caught smoking illicit substances and tested positive for amphetamines more than once. Things quickly escalated once more, when Brian assaulted a 17-year-old girl by blowing raspberries on her stomach. The police were called in, but nothing ever came of the matter. Brian admitted to this crime of his own free will, and he was subsequently transferred to Newham Hospital's open ward for his safety after the girl's family threatened him with violence. In Newham, Brian was once more free to come and go as he pleased. At this point, it had been 11 years since any significant violent incident had happened. He was seen as recovering, as safe, and a poster child for mental health and prison reform. It was during this time that he met a woman who introduced him to Brian Cherry. Everyone that knew Cherry described him as a kind-hearted loner, but someone who would let other people take advantage of him instead of being alone. Nicola Newman was the name of the woman who introduced Cherry to Peter. She was an addict who would show up at Cherry's house every so often to hang out and to take money from him. The depth of Peter and Brian's relationship was only known to the two of them, but it must have been fairly intimate for him to choose Cherry out of everyone that he had encountered. Peter headed over to Brian Cherry's flat in Walthamstow on February the 17th, 2004. He was armed once more with a claw hammer, a screwdriver and a Stanley knife. He arrived at Cherry's at 6pm. He then attacked him with the hammer. He struck him 24 times but didn't stop there. Peter proceeded to dismember Brian with the knife and the screwdriver that he brought with him. He cuts around the arm joints before applying considerable pressure to dislocate the joint and extract it. Peter Bryan then removed part of Brian Cherry's brain. He dropped it in a frying pan with some clover butter, and he placed another portion of it in a sieve by the kitchen sink. The fried portion was then consumed. At around 7.15, Nicola Newman let herself in to Cherry's flat. As one of his only friends, she had a key to his apartment. She was stunned when she noticed the strong smell of disinfectant coming from deep within the house. It was then that Brian emerged from the living room, bare-chested and sweaty, holding a sharp implement. When Nicola asked him where Brian Cherry was, he asked her to leave. She, however, persisted with her questioning, and it was then that Peter Bryan said, Brian is dead. Naturally, Nicola didn't believe him and walked past him to look deeper into the flat. To her utter horror, she found Brian Cherry, unclothed and deceased on the floor. Immediately, Nicola understood just how precarious her situation now was. Slowly and calmly, she exited the apartment and told Peter that she needed to leave. She ran for her life when she was clear from the flat, and then placed a call to the police to report this heinous crime. The police arrived at a scene that they'll go on to discuss in therapy for years to come. They found Peter Bryan waiting for them in the hallway. He was stood in the dark with his blood-stained hands, jeans and trainers. In the kitchen, they saw what remained of Brian's feast and the tub of clover that he'd used to fry it in. They noticed that the meat had pieces of bone, skin and hair still attached to it. When they saw what was left of Cherry's head, they immediately put two and two together. Peter Bryan declared to their utter horror, I ate his brain with butter. It was really nice. He later added upon his arrest, 
I would have done something else if you hadn't come along. I wanted their souls. Considering that Peter Bryan was found covered with red fluids, and with the objects that he used to end Brian Cherry within reach, there was still a surprising amount of investigating to be done. The analysis by the pathologist showed just how sick Peter still was, and how adept he'd been at covering it up for all these years. The severed left leg was partly sawn and partly fractured. At the top of the left, the muscle had been completely divided, and superficial sawing of the bone had commenced. These were the words of the pathologist. They concluded that Brian was most likely interrupted before he could complete the amputation of the leg, and Peter Brian later admitted as much when he was interviewed. He said, I used the standing knife to cut them off, and some other kitchen knife, but I had to stomp on them to break the bone. The investigators discovered that both Brian's psychiatrist and social workers did not have the experience or background to manage someone as manipulative and dangerous as he was. The social worker lacked any mental health training, and the psychiatrist had Brian as his first patient. The case of Peter Bryan revealed a systemic issue within the justice system. It showed how the system could be manipulated for the benefit of people like Peter. Unfortunately though, the case of Peter Bryan does not end here. After his arrest, he told authorities that he wanted to kill again. And that is exactly what he did. He was sent to Pentonville Jail. There, he told one member of staff that he wanted to end him, and he told another that he wanted to eat his nose. During his entire stay at that jail, he had to be minded with riot gear. He was later transferred to Broadmoor Maximum Security Hospital in April of 2004. There, they could watch and manage him better. However, his minders made the crucial mistake of transferring him to a minimum security risk ward. Again, they thought he'd settled down. Richard Loudwell was a 60-year-old man awaiting trial for the murder of an 82-year-old woman. He had allegedly violated and throttled her. This earned him the universal ire and hatred of everybody at the hospital, and Brian felt the exact same way. On April 25th, 2004 at 6.10pm, two members of staff heard two loud bangs coming from the dining room. They found Mr Loudwell lying on the floor next to a table. His face was covered in red vital fluids and there were marks on his neck. Somebody had throttled him with the cord from their trousers and had struck him on the head. He died of bronchopneumonia caused by severe brain injuries on June 5th. When Peter was found, he confessed to the murder almost instantly. He said, I get these urges, you see. I've had them ever since I saw him. He's at the bottom of the food chain, old and haggard. He looked like he'd had his innings. I just waited for my chances to get at him. I wanted to kill and eat him. I didn't have much time. If I did, I'd have tried to cook and eat him. When asked if he thought eating people was normal, he replied, Of course, it's normal. Cannibalism is normal. It's been there for centuries. If I was on the street, I'd go for someone bigger, you know, for the challenge. I wanted to cook him, but there was no time. On March the 15th, 2005, Judge Giles Forrester served Peter Bryan with two life sentences after he pleaded guilty to two counts of murder, but with diminished responsibility. The trial took place at the Old Bailey. Several witnesses were called forward by the prosecution. They wanted to give the jury a more comprehensive understanding of who Peter Bryan actually was. Decorated psychiatrist Dr. Martin Locke had their displeasure to carry out a series of interviews with Brian, and he declared him the most dangerous man I have ever assessed. Brian told the doctor, You look like a brainy chap, and you're quite slim. I think I could take you. Brian also described his second victim's limb as tasting like chicken. Coroner Peter Bedford described Brian as chillingly manipulative. Judge Forrester had this to say before he gave the sentence. 
You killed on these last two occasions because of a thrill and the feeling of power it gave you when you were flesh. Deemed too dangerous, Peter was sedated even during his trial and he was escorted by several of Broadmoor's largest nurses. He is being held there indefinitely. Even after Lord Chief Justice Phillips overturned the whole life tariff in 2006, turning his sentence to 15 years minimum. Considering the crimes Brian committed and his mental state, it is highly unlikely he will ever be released to the public ever again. The mental health system is even harder to escape than jail. Do you think the punishment fits the crime here? What do you think could be done to avoid something like this happening again in the future? Please do let me know down in the comments. Be careful out there and I'll see you soon.